I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Joshua 3. I'm going to have uh, one of our creative leaders, Anna Rittering. She's going to read the chapter for me. We're going to kind of read for a while. <clears throat> and uh, here's the deal. Sometimes when you read long chapters, uh, it's easy to just kind of like zone out and be like, yeah, I'll listen again when the, when the preacher starts. Again, <laughs> I just want to encourage you to, to just kind of lean in as, as Anna leads and, and, and just kind of listen to the scripture with fresh ears. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, Then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan... You shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take yourselves, 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the water of the Jordan that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from the upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So it was, when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, For the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Great job. Not going to lie, I was planning on skipping that verse if I read it, so nice work. (laughs) I believe that this uh, chapter is prophetic right now for the body of Christ, and, and I felt this personally, but that's shifted, so I, uh, I'm seeing something happen in the body of Christ right now where I believe there is a transition from the wilderness, which I'm going to talk about tonight, into the promised land. And this this chapter is so full of goodies. It's it's almost painful because I can only pick a couple of them to really talk about tonight, but there's so much meaning to this, but I want to kind of 
jump into this story a little bit because we kind of, we, we really focus on the exodus and the Lord kind of saving Israel. And then, you know, we, we, we start tapering off interest as the journey goes along. And, and a lot of times we really miss the, the importance of this moment. And uh, I kind of want to put before you Israel and where they're at in the story. And, and, and we all know the Exodus story. The Lord delivers them miraculously. Uh, for what? Why did he deliver them? Because he felt bad for them? No, they, they cried out. Israel really didn't do anything other than complain. And they complained and cried out, and the Lord heard them. And he says, I, I, I will free you so that you can worship me. And, uh, you know, we, we know the story of Israel coming out of the land and uh, the, the, the sea splits and Israel crosses over. And then we got, you know, a lot of stories in succession about Israel being really crappy. <laughs> like we have all kinds of complaining. We have rebellion. We have Moses goes up on the mountain, you know, has an encounter. They see this encounter happening and he comes back down and they've already melted down their own gold, which who does that anyway? Like if you're making an idol, like, I don't know, if I was an idol maker, like I'd use something a little more inexpensive than like my own personal gold, but they, they melt down their own gold and they're worshiping this idol. And, you know, Moses comes out and he's like, I leave for 40 days, 40 days, people. And you are already worshiping a golden calf. And, and, and they complain that they're not going to have water and they complain that they're not going to have food. And then they complain they have too much of that food. And then they complain they have a different food. And, and, and you, and you just see all of basically these signs, they're just insanely immature. They're a nation of slaves. They didn't know what to do or how to live their life, and, and uh, through all of that, the Lord still, even with all of that immaturity, has them continue the path to the promised land. There's only one point when Israel crossed the line where God says, nope, you can't go into the promised land. There was one sin. They had sexual sin. They had idolatry. They had complaining, rebelling against their leaders, lying. I mean, all of these things happened, and they still were actually on the trajectory to the promised land. But when they came to the edge of the promised land, the Lord said, okay, now it's time to take the land. And they said, no. Doubt and unbelief rose in their heart, and that's when the Lord said, no. The, the sin of unbelief was, was the sin that kept Israel out of the promised land. We see them wandering for 40 years, and, and a lot of times we think this is God like trying to really punish them, but, but, but what I believe is happening here is the promised land represented, we're going to dive in a little bit more, the promised land represented them stepping into the fullness of maturity that required them partnering with God in faith when everything before that just simply required them following with no action. Like in Egypt, they didn't partner with God to be liberated. They kind of just sat and did nothing and all these plagues came and, and, and God swings the door open and all they have to do is walk out. And then they don't even pick their own path. They follow a cloud and a fire. They come to a Red Sea, and God doesn't have them build boats. God doesn't have them swim. They literally just sit there, and God splits the rock. They go on the other side of the sea, and there's literally food for them every morning when they wake up. They get to a rock or a pond, and, and, and water miraculously comes forward. And then they don't, even have to, they don't even have to map out their own way. They just have to follow what's happening and Israel had gotten used to that and comfortable to that and the Lord said okay now it's time to take the land that you promised and Israel's like awesome how's it gonna work are we gonna stay over here on this side of the Jordan and then you're just gonna kind of send fire down from heaven and those 10 cities are all gonna burn or are we gonna cross the Jordan and then you know everyone just kind of like evaporates like an Avengers movie like how like how are you gonna do it God and he's like Here's how I'm going to do it. You're going to take the land and I'm going to be with you. And Israel goes, we're out. Unbelief rises in their heart. Was the unbelief that God couldn't do it? I, I don't think so because at that point they'd, they have to be pretty freaking stupid not to know that God could do that. Or was it when God said, no, you take the land, but I've given it to you. 
when it required stepping into faith and the symptom that was under the surface came out that there was doubt. And sometimes we can look like we have a lot of faith when we're just following the cloud, when the Red Seas are parting and we're like, woo, you split the sea and I'm just dancing through and you're doing everything and I got so much faith in my heart and God's like, awesome, now go slay some giants. And then all of a sudden, all that unbelief and doubt that we thought was gone just comes right to the surface. And God said, you can't take the promised land. And here's the thing. We look at that as God being like just wanting to really stick it to him for rebelling against him. I think that was God's kindness. Because if they tried to take the land in in, in unbelief, they would have died. They would have been routed. And so the next generation passes and it comes to a new day and a new leader steps up and there's been 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and God speaks to the leader, it's time. And he speaks this phrase and I hear this echoing in my spirit. He says, you have not gone this way before. You have not gone this way before. I feel that for us tonight. I feel that we are so used to stepping through the patterns of how God leads us. But I believe we're stepping into an hour that requires a greater faith, a greater victory, where we're stepping into our promised land of what God has called for us, but it requires us going a way we haven't gone before. He says, it's a way you haven't gone before, however... You still don't make it yourself. You still follow the presence of God. And this is the the faith that it would require. It's such a new aspect of what they were used to, and they couldn't have learned it through anything. It had to be given supernatural. See, wandering in the wilderness, you can go ahead and put that on the screen. Wanting in the wilderness requires no work to be fed. I mean, food literally shows up every single morning. Same for me, but that's because I have lots of Cap'n Crunch in my pantry, but different situation scenario. But it also requires no responsibility. It requires no leadership to move forward. Everything is handed to you. And no enemies are attacking you. It requires no work to be fed because you're being fed. No responsibility because you're being told what to do. No leadership to move forward because God's taking care of that. Everything's handed. There's no enemies attacking you because your land sucks. (laughs) There's nothing there. And so Israel's just kind of getting fat and sassy on manna, wandering around. And and there's got to be something in them that's like, Man, I've heard stories about the promised land, but man, it, this, this is nice. You know, it's the 25-year-old who still wants to live in his basement. It's like, yeah, marriage and kids is cool, but, you know, no work, no responsibility, no leadership. Everything's handed to me. Like, ah, maybe the parents' basement's cool for a while. And the promised land, on the other side of things, you can switch that up to the next slide. The promised land requires faith in what God spoke. He says, hey, this is your land, but I'm not going to just hand it to you. You have to step out in new faith. It requires confidence in your calling. You got to know, when you're going against 10 cities that are all bigger and badder and have better walls and machinery and armies than you, you better know that you're called. It requires fighting for what God gave you. Previously, all you've known is God, the God who fights for you. You've never met the God who fights with you. It requires planting and building. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. But when did the manna stop? When they crossed over the Jordan, it was actually, it wasn't the second they crossed over the Jordan. It was actually a much more painful moment. They cross over the Jordan, and the Lord says, there's one more thing. You still have a last reproach of Egypt. You need to be circumcised. And when the men had healed from circumcision, when the healing of the final reproach of slavery 
had left them and they were fully healed from the oppression of slavery, the manna stopped. So it required planting and building. The promised land provided clear borders. And hold on to that last one for a second, because here's the thing. When you look at those two lists, you're like, I mean, man, food's given to you. First, you have to work for it. Leadership is given to you. First, you have to lead. One risks your life. The other one is super safe. What's the big deal with, with the promised land? And that's, that leads us to our last one. The promised land positions you for overflow. The only difference I propose between those two plots of land, one was just enough for what you needed, and one contained everything possible for you to not only have enough for you, but to overflow. I want to read a passage from Genesis twenty-two fifteen. This is the passage where he's promising the land and inheritance to Abraham. This is the start of the nation of Israel. And the angel of the Lord said to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will multiply your offspring and the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed. In your offspring, the nations of the earth shall be blessed. When Israel crossed over into the Jordan, they weren't just inheriting a better land. They were stepping into their identity as a people. And the identity as a people was a God who never intends for you to have just enough, but a God whose heart is to position you for overflow. See, God, he's not like us. Everything in our life is limited. Our money, our energy, our time. We have a number on how much we have and how much we don't. We deal in limit. God doesn't deal in limit. God only deals in abundance. See, God doesn't have a, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, how much money does God have as a bank account? Like 100 million, 500 million, 500 billion? Because that's the only way you can comprehend. And, and it's like, well, God, I guess he kind of has a bank account, but it's endless. His love, endless. Joy, peace, patience, endless. Everything God has is in abundance. And to truly be a representation of his heart. We have to be a people that live for overflow. And, 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 and I want to say this with, with, with kindness, but I feel that there's so many in the church that we're so content to live off manna. We're so content to just eat what's handed to us, to go wherever everyone else is going, to not have any enemies, and given the choice between having to step across the Jordan and take what God has promised so that we could bless the world around us, we're like, man, I'm good. Because God didn't make it a salvation issue. You can live and wander in the wilderness for 40 years and Jesus loves you. You can have great God time and, and, and you know, you can love life. You can enjoy what's happening. You can get, in, and you'll get to heaven. This is not a salvation issue. And you can live in that place. But I believe the Lord is starting to call his people and say, Hey, America, I didn't design you to wander in the wilderness, eating manna, not stepping into what God had for you. It, it's time for the message. It's time for the revelation of God's heart to flow outside of the four walls of the church. It's time for it to flow outside the walls of our home because there is a hurting and a dying world that they are starving for what we are feasting on tonight. What we have in this room, what God is doing in our midst, what he's been doing all week, and I'm starting, and I've never been this person. I've always been the person of like, you know, I just, 
I just, I just want that for, for me, and if I'm going to be really honest, I, I've never been that massive evangelist guy, but something is happening in me where, where I'm like, this has got to begin to overflow. It's got to be more than just for us, because I'm seeing what's happening in the world around me. And so I want to talk about overflow tonight. I'm going to talk about two aspects of it. Then we're going to spend some time in prayer at the end. So I got, <clears throat> by the way, the sermon title is called Overflow. Very creative. We're at a creative conference. These points are also going to sound very, very creative. <laughs> I want to talk about overflow in you. And this, this is going to blow your mind. It requires inflow. I know that's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, you can clap for that. <clears throat> okay, you don't have to. It's fine. I want to read John seven thirty seven. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is kind of off the theme of what Lee spoke about. But, but I want to I highlight something. It says, come and drink. It doesn't say, come and think. And the mind is a very important part of our walk with the Lord. But here in the West, we have elevated the mind above the other aspects of who God has created it to be. And in elevating it, we have choked the stream that God has intended for us to drink. See, we are made in the image of God. You know, that, that doesn't mean that God looks like he's, you know, 6'3", and, you know, I don't know, whatever's my long torso and looking like a meerkat. I, I don't think it has to do as much with, <laughs> with physical appearance. Yeah, I know. And you're also, I know, I'll just say it for you. You're thinking, who is this guy who looks like Julian Smith and talks like David Spade? So, yeah, I'm a nice, I'm, if I had, those two guys had a baby, that would be me. So when I talk about being made in the image of God, I, I don't think as much appearance. But God, what is, God is comprised of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a reality of three that are, that are individual but are actually just one reality. One is not greater than the other. They serve one another and they have different leadership roles. You are body, soul, and spirit. You are also comprised of three components of who you are. One is not greater than the other, but there's moments for each part of who you are to lead and there's times for it to serve. And the mind has a very important role when it comes to truth. When the mind is not submitted, when the mind is either elevated or de-elevated, we can lose track of truth. But what has happened in the West is we have allowed the mind to actually be elevated over the spirit and the heart, which has choked off the flow of the spirit. And we have done that by letting information and knowledge rule over what God has simply said. When God says something, there's something in the West where our mind, if our mind likes it, then we'll kind of receive it. And Jesus likened truth to a seed. And he told a parable about a, a sower who threw seed, and some of the seed went into the ground and produced life, and some seed did nothing. The seed represents truth. Hearing truth and comprehending it in your mind is not the seed going into the ground and bringing out life. It's just like having a seed in your hand. 
For the seed to give birth to life, it has to go into the ground and die, which is the part of it. If anyone thirsts, they have to drink of me and take me into their spirit, and then they have to obey it. And when they obey it, that truth then transforms their life, and then it produces a river of living water. And here's what's happened. We're We're carrying around packets of seeds, packets of truth. And because we've heard them, because we have it in our hands, we think we have a harvest. We think we have fruit. Hey, I got the fruits of the Spirit because I got the truth. I know all the scriptures. I know all the concepts. I know all the songs. I know all the theology. I know all the doctrine. I know how it works. But we've never actually allowed it into our life and we've never believed it and let it produce the fruit and the life. And and then when something offends our mind, we say, no thanks. And Jesus says, take it in. And then it says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Listen, he does not say out of your mind will flow rivers of living water. He's speaking to your spirit. He's saying your mind's job is to listen, to hear it, and then to pass it on to your spirit and let him do something supernatural and then let him then pull it back out of you and on its way out it brings transformation and it liberates the mind to think. But if the mind is in charge and says no thanks, it shuts it down. And the Lord over and over and over again, the work of the spirit is purposefully offensive to the mind. The gift of tongues is on purpose supposed to not make sense to your mind. Well, what, what, what's happening? What am I saying? Your mind doesn't know. Well, I don't like that. Well, why don't you like that? Well, one of the fruits of spirit is self-control. Absolutely. For sure. Is your mind not in control in that moment? Well, no, it's in, but my mind doesn't know what's happening. Okay. But the Holy Spirit's speaking through you? Yeah, but, but my mind doesn't understand it. Okay? What's, what's the problem here? We, we have put self-control with the mind being in control all the time. Guess what? We've elevated the mind, and the Lord wants to baptize the mind along with the soul and the spirit and rise all of it in newness of life. And that takes obedience, and that means taking in truth and letting it affect your heart. And here, here's, here's where that happens, obedience. I just got back from, uh, I was traveling for about 60 hours. I was there for 38 hours. I was with, with 50 leaders in the church in Iran. And uh, it was one of the most life-changing uh, 38 hours <laughs> I've ever had. And uh, some of the testimonies were absolutely insane. And uh, these people, it's the fastest growing church in the world, in this room of 50 people represented, they had personally led 10 to 50 to 100,000 people to the Lord themselves. And it's amazing what God is doing in the Middle East, by the way. We, we, the, the, the media wants to just show you the negative and the fear. God, guys, the mosques are being emptied out. Christianity is rampant. Revival is happening. And even through oppression, I, the, let me, the level of faith of these, of these leaders, that I had this woman... She was sharing her testimony on camera. I got to sit in on it. And, and they said, what does suffering of the gospel mean to you? And, and she grabs the mic and she goes, well, suffering of the gospel means in Iran, you know, if you continue to share your faith, you'll get caught. And if you're a woman, if you get caught, you're going to be raped. And she said, I have, whew, I'm going to try to get through this. <clears throat> she said, I have made the decision that I'm probably going to be raped. But Jesus sacrificed his body for me, and this is my sacrifice, and it's my honor to sacrifice my body for him. And uh, man, I heard that, and I, I thought of this promised land speak. She's like, I, I know what it costs, but, but I'm not willing to keep this gospel to myself. And, and I watched how they loved each other, and, and uh, so many things provoked me. And then some of these pastors and leaders I started talking to the leader, and, and he's like, yeah, they don't have Bibles. They're not allowed to have Bibles. I said, a lot of these guys know 5, 10, 15 verses. I was like, what? And uh, this guy, I met with the leader of the church in Iran, and he basically just ripped me a new one for about an hour. <laughs> it was beautiful, amazing. And he said, yeah. He's like, here's the problem, Caleb. He said, in America, you measure maturity by knowledge. He said, you'll elevate any leader that knows how to communicate, that, that knows doctrine, he's like, 
He's like, they could, they could, he's like, you know why all your leaders are following in sexual immorality and all these things? He's like, because if someone has knowledge, you say that they're a leader. And, and they go, we don't measure maturity by knowledge, we measure it by obedience. If their life is fully submitted to the Lord, if they are fully laid down, that is a mature life. They said, Jesus did not come to the disciples and say, memorize the Bible, memorize every command. I'm going to give you a thousand commands, and when you learn those, then you can follow me. He gave them one command. What was it? Follow me. And then as you obey, I'll give you more and more and more and more and more. I realized, that, man, how backward do we have it? It's because we have elevated the place of the mind. And again, I, I, I don't want to, the reason I, I'm hammering that is, is not because the mind is bad. No, no, no. It's a very important part the pro, uh, 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 of, of our body and, and, and our spirit and who we are. However, I'm trying to hit something where when we are talking about the issue of drinking something in and letting something flow out of us, we can't let our mind rule everything. There has to be a place where we just receive the simple commands of Jesus, whether we like it or not, and let it go down where we say, God, I, I will obey, I will listen, and then let the transfer happen from there. It's like we have these seeds of truth because we have more knowledge, guys, than any group of Christian in history. The, the problem is we don't, we, it's not that we need to know more. We don't need more information. We need more revelation and revelation, like Lee said last night, it's disclosed. It's given to us by a person. And, and I feel that we've seen in our, 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 our Christian art, we've taken the seeds. And, and we're like, okay, if I just take these seeds of truth and just put it in some type of art form, it will have power. And we're like, okay, if I just write a cool, you know, let's, let's just rip some cool Coldplay melody. And if I just... If I just take scripture verbatim, because scripture is powerful, if I just take it, then, it, then it's going to transform lives, and the, and, and the art goes nowhere. Why? Because you have to plant the seed somewhere. You have to let the truth go into your heart. You have to let it fester. You have to submit to it. You have to obey it. You have to wrestle with it, and then let the revelation come out, and the revelation is what brings transformation and power. So we take him in, we drink deeply, and then out comes the rivers of living water. We need, guys, we need, we need people that are just rivers of living water just poof, explodes out of them. You take it in like a drink. I love that. It's our time in the morning. We take in that phrase. God highlights a phrase and we sit under it and it's like, oh man, that's a nice... And then later on in the day, we write this song or we preach this message or we share this person. And what was just like a nice moment suddenly becomes like whoosh, this raging torrent of power because God says that, that, that's the power of the truth. But I, I'm not going to just blow people away with the truth. I'm going to use you. But I'm not going to use you to just throw seed packets at people, to throw information and things that are true. People don't want to hear things that are true about God. They want to experience a life who has encountered a person and let that truth do something and release that power of God through them. Number one, we need, we need inflow. And it needs to be more than just taking in knowledge. We need to encounter him in his presence. Number two is let Jesus bring the increase. I want to read this parable to you. Matthew 14, 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from the boat to a desolate place by himself. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a crowd. And he had compassion on them and healed the sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. And the day is now over. Send the crowds away, for they need to go home and buy food. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the 12 baskets of broken pieces and there's 12 baskets left over. <clears throat> and those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women 
and children. Now, the, the miracle of 5,000 was several, several things. One is not, or sorry, having not enough is not excuse for not operating in overflow. And Jesus commanded the disciples to feed them. And the disciples thought they had nothing, but what did, what did they have? They had a command. When Jesus gives you a command, the power to fulfill that command exists within the command itself. And they offered what was in their hands with faithfulness, believing there was more. Supernatural multiplication was right around the corner. The 12 baskets. What did the 12 baskets represent? Represent. Jesus was, was teaching the disciples something. This was not just about feeding people that were hungry. Because the disciples were the one who, who had brought this issue to Jesus. And Jesus goes, well, you, you're the one who spotted the problem. Why are you coming to me? And what Jesus is trying to train them. Look, I could snap my fingers and fill their bellies in a moment. But Jesus is trying to teach them something. He's saying, good, you notice the need. Bad, you're just wanting me to fix it and you to do nothing. What do you have in your hands? Well, we have five loaves and two fish. Okay, you feed them. And there was a supernatural multiplication when they poured out. What they, what they took in like a drink transformed into a river. And they fed them. And here's what the 12 baskets mean. And, and I feel like this small point is, is for some of you in this room is, Jesus is saying, listen, when you pour out and you give and you serve, you'll pour out, but I will always, always, always have enough for you. There's 12 baskets, one for each disciple. When you pour yourself out, when you overflow, God says, I'm not a God who just wants to spend you and use you. I want you to be full too. I want you to have revelation. I want you to live a life. I don't want to, I want, I don't want to just use you. Jesus was saying, if you pour yourself out, it'll be enough for you. And the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't about 5,000 as much as it was convincing the future apostles. Jesus is enough for you. The need for the food, it was impossible. It was immediate. And they had no answer. And they only had five loaves and two fish. Boy, that... That seems fitting, right? <laughs> that seems like the, the church right now, right? We look at what's happening in the world around us. Like, holy crap, everything's getting wild. <laughs> like, people are angry all the time. Everything's political. There's, there's murder happening everywhere. People seem to hate Christians more than ever. And gosh, the people are hungry and in need. And, and we don't have enough. Jesus goes, perfect. What do you have? I'm going to bless what you have, and I'm going to supernaturally multiply it. And then I'm going to leave more than enough for you. I love the, the, the last thing on this point, Jesus turning the water into wine. I, I, I'm feeling that picture because I, I think we love the Jesus party animal angle, right? Like, Jesus loves party. Like, wow, he would turn everything to Bud Light now because he loves the party. And I do think there was something about breaking the, the religious spirit that Jesus particularly enjoyed in that moment. Uh, so I don't want to fully discount that. But Jesus is doing something a little bit deeper, too. He's saying, I am the God who can turn water into wine. What is he saying? He's saying, if you let me into the circumstances of your life, what you take in as pain, these moments that are really difficult and hard. You know, I got to go back. Tonight was traumatic for me. And I have to go back and spend some time with the Lord. And I could shut that off. Or I could go back and say, Lord, I feel like the enemy came at me. I felt exposed. I felt this was because I was serving. It felt like because this was true north. And, and, and I open my heart up. And I drink in that pain. And I let him in. He says, good. And then supernaturally, what goes in as water, he goes, let me transform that water to wine. Let me heal your heart. And then what was once pain is joy. What was sorrow is now laughter. See, we're not supposed to be this fake expression of joy. We're supposed to let God into the most painful, difficult circumstances of our life. And he says, let me in, let me heal you, and let me turn you from that water vat that was worthless at the wedding. That water vat represented the failure and the the, the 
inability to plan, he says, let me turn it to wine. And let me turn it to a source that's more than you could ever fill. Overflow. We have, we have to be drinking him in. We have to be receiving more than just the truth of what he's saying, but the encounter of what he's doing around us. So that's the first part of overflow. The second part of overflow is overflow around us. Here's, let's take us back to the story. So here's Israel. Israel is about to cross the Jordan. And if, you know any, if you've ever been to Israel and, and you, you know that in seasons of harvest, the Jordan River goes from just a nice little stream to a massive river that can destroy you. And if you were thinking, wait, when's the best time for me to cross over? You'd pick the time where the Jordan River is like a little trickle, right? And God says, oh, I'm watching the Jordan River. It's time to cross. And Joshua's going, what? The, the Jordan? The Jordan, is, the Jordan is overflowing. And what does the scripture say? That the Jordan River overflows in a time of what? Harvest. I want to read this passage from Revelation really quick. Don't have to turn there. Revelation 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud sat, one, sat the son of man having a head, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And then another angel came out to the temple crying with a loud voice, thrust the sickle and reap for the time is come to reap a harvest for the earth is ripe. Do you know, what, you know what's happening in the scripture? Chaos is happening. <laughs> People are shaking their fists at God. There's demonic locusts. There, there is the most evil that the world has ever seen. And God calls that season harvest. We're getting to a time in the church where we're looking at the world around us and we're being like, man, the world is so messed up. Like, whoo. You know, the, the Jordan River starting to really overflow. That, that thing that represents, you know, our enemies. Like, man, things are getting crazy. Sexual immorality is out of control. Pop culture is this. There's violence. Nobody seems to care for, for Christianity. And, and most people are looking with eyes of doubt and saying, man, I guess it's time to hunker down and, and just stay over here in the wilderness. And God is looking for an army of people that are saying, no, 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 don't you understand? The banks of the Jordan overflow in the season of harvest. This, God has not fallen off his throne like Corey was singing earlier. God is the one who's bringing these things into fruition and he's saying, I know if I pull the things that are under the surface and I pull them to the surface, my leaders and my church will recognize that this is the season of harvest. And when the overflow in them meets the overflow around them, they walk through the opposition and step into the promised land and they provide overflow for the world around them. We have to look at the signs of the times. We have to see the overflow and stop being overwhelmed by it. And start partnering with the heart of the Lord that says, now is the time to harvest. Guys, the, the, the fish are not going to jump into the boat. Salvation is not just going to happen in the building. But we're so afraid because we don't know what to do intellectually. Because we don't have the argument for, there's so much noise and on social media. And everybody has the argument of what to say. And God's like, that's exactly the point. I don't need people that are a little bit better at presenting the gospel on an intellectual level. I need people, when people come in with arguments and words and strongholds that exalt itself above the knowledge of God, they say, hey, that's a great argument, but I got a river inside. And that river is life and power. And they open their mouth and simple words are released and peace, joy, love, the life of a Christian that has encountered the fruit of the Spirit comes out and there's no argument that can stop that flow. There's no intellectualism that can stop the kingdom of God being released. But it takes a people that notice this is the time of harvest. The banks of the Jordan are overflowing. That's not the time to cower, guys. It's the time to cross. And here's why we don't have to be afraid. Because we don't have to, to cross ourselves. We haven't gone this way before. It's scary. But his presence is going first. And his presence 
is leading us. And he's saying, guys, it's time. It's time to step out of the place of comfort, of just, just enough in the wilderness where we're in our own camps while there's a world dying around us. Because on the other side of that river, there are fields that are ripe for the harvest. If we can plant that truth on the other side, and guys, that river, I, f- I feel it in my spirit. There's things that we have been afraid of. Sexual immorality. The church is terrified of, uh, of the homosexual agenda. I have felt that too. I felt overwhelmed by the, I, I don't have the right argument, I'm the right words, and, and it seems like we don't have power in this area. The Lord is giving us a new authority through his leadership. If we will follow him to the Jordan River, I believe on the other side of that river, there is a gospel. You can't convince me there's somebody so lost in sexual brokenness that they can't get healed. There isn't somebody who has such an agnostic spirit that they can't encounter God, but it requires somebody, somebody who's willing to look past that and peer with eyes of faith and see that there's more for us than against us. God says he doesn't do anything unless he reveals it to his friends, the prophets, right? Amos 3, 7. Saul had an encounter. What does that mean? It means maybe everyone was afraid of Saul before he was Paul. But it means there was at least one Christian who looked at the life of the most religious zealot, the most hateful man, the man with the most anger who was doing nothing but slaughtering Christians. And somebody stood in the presence of God and says, Lord, I know that all anybody sees is this. But God, I choose to look with your eyes. God, this Saul guy, God, he's so smart. God, what if he was an apostle? What if he, what if he wrote What if he could lead churches? God, I ask that you, I don't know, one day would you appear to him on a road? Would you knock him off his horse and you give him an encounter? A man with an encounter is never at the mercy, or sorry, a man with an opinion is never at the mercy of the man with an encounter. And a man with a billion opinions and a billion religious ideas, one encounter, and become the the greatest apostle that, that wrote so much in scripture. What if that person we're so afraid of, that celebrity that we hate so much, we, we see stuff and we're, 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 we're so like surprised that unbelievers are doing unbelieving things. Like, oh my gosh, this person who doesn't love Jesus just said this thing that shows they don't love Jesus. And this movie is dark and bad. And how could they do that? They don't love Jesus. They haven't tasted the light. And, and we need to switch our thinking. When we see those things, instead of being afraid or isolating or pushing them away, we're saying, you know what? I think the banks of the Jordan are overflowing, and it's about to be harvest time. And I'm going to step up my prayer game, and I'm going to step up my faith game, and I am going to, to walk forward knowing I have something they need. I drank something they haven't drank yet. And what I took in as a little drink that didn't seem to do anything is a raging torrent, is a river of transformation, tr- transformational power in life that is ready to reach every person where they're at. I want to invite the worship team to come forward tonight. When the overflow of his presence touches the overflow of the world around you, transformation happens all around you. As the worship team comes forward, I want to take some time. I know that that we started late, but some of the reason we wanted to do this format and everything was to take moments to be able to pray. And I feel that there's many of you in here that you feel like there's not a raging river in you. Or you have felt that, man, I feel there's so much in me, but something is choking it. There's this fear, there's this intimidation, or there's, there's no opportunity or outlet. There was, a, there was a young girl about a year ago who I was praying with, and she was, she was feeling the Holy Spirit, and she's a member of this community here. And when I laid hands on her, the, the, the Lord saying, hey, right, right now, 
there has been things inside of you and the enemy has stopped those things from coming out and he has stopped you from, from being a mother. And this, I was, it, it was, took a little bit of risk on my part because I knew this girl had been struggling with infertility for about three, four years. I said, what's happening in the natural is happening in the spirit. The enemy is choking out. You are meant to be a mother. You carry in you rivers of living water. You carry within you revelation like a baby, but it's, it's just stayed inside of you. The enemy has choked it out. And he's choked it out because there has been an area of fear that, that you haven't laid down before the Lord. And we began to pray, and she was feeling the Holy Spirit, and, and there's a, there a, there a long word with that. But long story short, she released. There was a moment, and there was a thing, and, and she just released what was inside of her. And uh, it was a sweet prayer moment. And, and then in about a week, I got a text. We're pregnant. <laughs> they figured she conceived about two nights after that happened. And it wasn't the power of my, my prayer. She, there was something in the natural and the spiritual where the enemy, even though he, or, or let me say it this way, the enemy couldn't stop what she took in. And she was taking in revelation and, 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 and had spent so much time with Jesus, but through fear and other circumstances, it had stopped up that well that was inside of her. And was closing our mouth. And so it, if the enemy can't stop revelation from going in, he'll grab your neck to try to stop it from coming out. And I felt tonight that the, that the Lord was like, man, there's some people in here, they feel like that. They're like, man, I got songs inside of me. I got evangelism inside of me. I got art inside of me. I got sermons. I got teaching. I got prophecy. I got encounter. I got it, but it's just stuck. It's just in there, and I don't know how to get it out. And I believe the Lord is knocking a hole in that dam that has stopped the rivers of living water to come out. And the first one that I want to pray for, Cassie actually had a word. I want to invite her to come up and, and share it, and I got a second one I'll pray after that. But the first way I believe the enemy and the, where he wants to bring healing tonight is through the issue of, of pain and wounds and, and unforgiveness. So, Cass, if you just share that word. Yeah, it was um, last year, April, I took three weeks just to get before the Lord and um, just have seen a lot in my lifetime, mid-30s and processing a lot of things. And it took about two and a half weeks to even just honestly open the word. I just had to be with him and just talk with him. And I, but I felt his kindness and like, it's okay, you know. And I do have a heart for like the, the 30s generation. But um, finally, like the last two days, he took me to Hebrews 12 and I read the Passion Translation, which I really love. And this just really stuck out to me, and, and we know it, but I want to expound on it. It says, as for us, we have all, all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into, that we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has already been marked out before us. And so the footnote, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us, um, and it says... Uh, my Kindle. De -de -de. But the implication is like the wound is like an arrow that has been shot into your heart and that the arrow tip has stayed there. So like the wound is still present. And so there's times where I think as believers, we've taken the arrow kind of out and we're like, we believe you're good. We believe you're good and declare the promises. But there's an arrow tip still remnant into in our hearts that we've kind of just shoved into the back and there's disappointment and, and potentially bitterness and offense and just like, well, I don't really know what to do with that. I don't know how to have a conversation with you there. So I'm just going to tuck it over here and just kind of keep charging. But anytime we come to those places, we're like, okay, I want to believe again. There's this weight behind us that keeps us like, mm, not, I'm not sure if you're good here though. I can believe you're good here, but I'm, I don't believe that you're good here. And so I just re-engaging with the Lord on those conversations of real pain and real brokenness that he's not scared to have those conversations but oftentimes I think we feel um, 
like it's not okay to go into the real honest places like Caleb's saying he's, he's gonna have to have an honest conversation with the Lord tonight like what the heck happened like you know but to actually take him into the most painful places and to feel his healing and exchanging lies for truth and all of those things to go like I can now actually stand on this promise that you were good here and to remove the arrow tip that's in our in our hearts in different spaces so that was the the word I felt